afternoon, friends and viewers. I am Reverend Chantel Hinton Hill, and I am an equity officer at the Winter Rockefeller Foundation, the folks who are sponsoring this conversation series. Welcome to the greatest of these, where we will discuss voter suppression and civic engagement on today. This conversation series um, is a part of an exciting new venture that the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation um, is partnering with several organizations across the state and the nation, Faith Matters Network, um, the Methodist Foundation and others uh, to begin a faith fellows program for leaders across the state who want to engage in the work of economic equity and justice. You will hear more about the Micah Fellows Program at the end of this conversation series, um, but I'm really excited to have my friends with you on today. Um, I'm gonna to introduce to you next, the Reverend Ryan Davis, a dear friend um, and supporter of economic justice work in Arkansas, who is going to be leading these conversations and also coordinating the Micah Fellows Program. With that, welcome, and I hand it over to you, Ryan. Thank you to Reverend Chantel Hinton Hill. Uh, thank you to our guest panelists who are joining us today. And uh, if y'all indulge me for just a second, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, our first panelist, and I'm, and I'm doing this in the order of the squares on my screen. Uh, first panelist, Reverend Preston Clegg, is not only a friend, but he's the pastor of Second Baptist Church, uh, sec I'm sorry, Second Baptist Church downtown Little Rock, Arkansas. Next friend, guest, Rosa Velasquez, who is a consultant, an activist, and the former executive director and founder, co-founder of the Arkansas Coalition for Dream. Welcome, Reverend Velasquez. You mind if I call you Reverend? And certainly last but not least, Reverend Dr. Teresa Smallwood, who I have to say I fanned out a little bit because um, I had the pleasure of being with uh, Reverend Dr. Smallwood uh, at the forum, at, uh, along with Dr. Ivan Carruthers um, and so many uh, other um, great um, uh, gospel exemplars, I would say, um, uh, back at Reverend Griffith's Church in 2019. Uh, Reverend Dr. Smallwood is uh, currently the Public Theology and Racial Justice Collaborative Associate Director at Vanderbilt Divinity School. And we're all here today to talk about, um, I, I feel like I'm on the view because this is a hot topic. This is a boilerplate for legislator, legislators around the country. Um, so I um, wanna bring, bring some to the fore. Um, not very long ago, the Hope Policy Institute uh, which covers uh, work in states of Mississippi, uh, part of well, western parts of Tennessee, uh, Louisiana, and Arkansas, recently published a report making the connection between uh, mass incarceration and the lack of financial services in particular states. Uh, that connection was made about uh, uh, the debt incurred by the um, uh, criminal incarceration system and uh, the cost incurred by states to imprison uh, folks almost indefinitely. Um, we also know that Arkansas is quickly becoming one of the largest incarcerators of people in the country. But we're here today to talk about voter suppression and civic engagement. So what I actually would like to talk about is the fact that um, Arkansas, like so many other states uh, in the nation, but particularly in the South, in the South passed a series of um, changes to our election laws this year, the effect of which will certainly suppress uh, voter activity in um, communities where voter activity has not been above 50% since the, since the 1980s. Arkansas ranks in the, almost at the top, but rather the bottom five states for voter participation in the country. Uh, and now we have uh, in action, more stringent voter identification laws. We have restriction on the amount of days for voting. 
And um, so I'd really just like to begin our conversation around that and um, with the lens toward how our faith informs uh, how we address these things. And so I welcome uh, any of our guests to start. Uh, Reverend Dr. Smallwood, would you? Well, thank you so much for that um, really uh, powerful opening. And it's not lost on me that you mentioned mass incarceration because obviously incarcerating people is a way to um, cloud the vote. And what we know about um, you know, prison-based gerrymandering is very important because what we have is a whole lot of people incarcerated being counted in terms of the bodies, but not being accountable to by people who are legislatively um, responsible. Uh, but what I will say is that uh, these are old ideologies that have never died. We're up against some very important um, upticks in uh, voter suppression because the death rattle to those who have been um, you know, property owning white men largely, uh, who have always been in charge, who have uh, mastered capitalism to, uh, to the death. They're coming to understand that the population for which they have operated is growingly uh, uh, old and dying out. And so the issue of voter suppression is the same as it always was. Let's hold back anybody that we feel would become a majority. And that majority, uh, if, if, if we really look at it today with present demographics, would be black and brown people, folk who are having babies. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, in the black population, it's always been that we're not even human. So let's uh, get back to those to those wares, those ideological wares that we have always done. They've all there has always been an effort in this country to keep people from voting. Fannie Lou Hamer is my uh, exemplar, but there are so many others historically. And uh, what we really need to do in this country at this present moment is come to understand that it's not old. The playbook is the same, and we have to develop new and important. Uh, mechanisms, and I think Stacey Abrams has given us an exemplar for that. Rosa, um, because you, you've done this work uh, very recently in this legislative session, you know, I, I, I suppose I would ask you, you know, what, what are some remedies, uh, particularly for, uh, for faith communities, because you know, we, we're talking about in the state of Arkansas, faith communities really being some of the most independent uh, institutions and some of the most influential. So what for, um, from the perspective of, again, of someone who is, um, um, who come, came out unscathed from this uh, legislative session, um, what are some remedies, some solutions, some actions that faith communities should consider and should be taking to, um, you know, to a prepare us for uh, this coming election in 2022 when these uh, these um, voter suppression laws will be in place, and also to to fight against them. Thank you so much, Reverend. Um, so, I guess in terms of uh, of preparing, the church has always fundamentally been a, a pillar of trust for the Latinx community. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot that could be done within within those institutions. Um, there's they could be vocal. Um, I, I guess more vocal than uh, than a lot of them have been. Um, I know that one of the um, during one of the the committee meetings, there was a pastor that went and um, and, and made the legislators uncomfortable uh, by speaking truth. Um, and, and I think that that was, for me, that was one of the most uh, interesting um, and, and really informative uh, sessions, uh, committee meetings, because they, it's like they were trying to use the word, um, they were trying to use scriptures from the Bible to, uh, to validate their suppression. Um, and when this pastor came and started saying, you know, this is not actually what you're doing, you're actually suppressing. Um, it, it was it was a punch in the gut for a lot of them. So for, for that moment, I know that the church was um, was doing what I believe a, a lot of us were doing, um, which was advocating on the community side. Um, and and um, the 
again, the charges have been a place for safety for our communities. So um, doing, you know, having uh, meetings at the uh, at the churches has been something that the um, that for my my community, the Latinx community, has been crucial for information. Uh, I remember last year, whenever we were uh, in the election cycle, y'all, this is this is real. Um, the um, language access was so difficult for our voters last year. Um, we saw mailers that were in Spanish with the wrong dates, and <laughs> we're thinking like, no, like you know, November the 4th is the day that you go out to vote. Um, but the dates that were in the Spanish flyer were wrong. Um, and the church was the, um, the community where the community went. So that's where we provided the information. So opening up the doors for, um, you know, for, for these types of practices, for these types of community um, engagement events um, are really important um, because that's where a lot of our folks were saying, hey, I'm receiving this mailer that says we go vote on November the 9th. Um, and we're, we're saying, no, discard that. Um, but it came from a place of trust where, um, where the church has always been for, for the Latinx community. Um, and in terms of fighting these, these laws is, is just this, being able to provide this information to their community. Because um, let's say here in Little Rock, um, the Catholic churches are the ones that are predominantly Latinx, um, Southwest Little Rock, even downtown. If they were able to let us uh, provide information on this is the community committee meeting that's happening tomorrow at such and such time, um, or these are the folks that you need to go to. And if you want help uh, voting, because even then me as a Latinx person or a bilingual person can only help six people during one uh, election cycle. Um, I can only help six people translate, uh, whether it's going into the, um, to the voting booth with them or whether it's providing direct translation on um, on the ballot and it's six people in one election i have six people in my immediate family that can go vote you know there's hundreds and thousands of people that need that translation service so that if the church could could um could provide that that opportunity for uh, you know for our translators and we need to get rid of these draconian laws anyway but um but serving as a sanctuary for that um would be ideal for for the community and providing a little bit of relief on on voter suppression And, and Rosa, I was there that uh, committee room with that uh, that preacher who I won't call call out. He's not on this call with us. Um, who um, kind of took him to seminary, <laughs> Amen. And uh, you know, somebody coming out, a, a legislator actually said, "Now that is a good example of a prophetic witness." Mm -hmm. And uh, Reverend Clegg, you know, um, in my experience. Um, a lot of times the prophetic witness of the church has been um, um, inactive. It's, uh, it's been in word, it's been in our prayers, it's been in our hopes. Um, and yet uh, I see in you, because I, 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 know, I know your work here in Little Rock, um, the, 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 the move toward a different path. And so, you know, what, what can we bring to bear as, um, as church folks? Um, and I guess it's very similar to the question that Dr. Smallwood and Reverend Velasquez have already answered, but um, in your estimation, in your work, what, what can we bring to bear to, to make our prophetic witness more active, especially for something so specific as uh, voter suppression uh, in the state of Arkansas? Yeah, I think uh, very little in the Christian scriptures happened in private, right? most of the Christian public witness or is just that, it's public witness. And I think that's something the white church has lost. Uh, or we've done it in such a way that it compromised our witness. And so what I've tried to do is show an alternative way uh, to, to be prophetic in public that doesn't give Jesus a bad name. Um, you know, one of the things as a Baptist, I often hear the phrase separation of church and state, right? Like, um, in some people's minds, when they say that, what they mean is a separation of faith and public life. But that is not what separation of church and state means. Uh, that is a way of providing cover for not speaking about injustice or not living our faith in public. What separation of church and state does mean 
is that the machinery of the state and the machinery of the church are kept separate, right? That the church isn't using tax dollars for a sectarian purpose, nor, um, nor is the, the state uh, funding, you know, sectarian work that should be done in a church house. That's what separation of church and state means. So for something like voting, since we're talking about voting, I do think it would be a violation of church and state for me to uh, host a voting clinic and tell people who to vote for, because then I'm using sectarian funds for a specific political purpose. But it is not a violation of separation of church and state uh, to get people registered to vote or uh, to take people to voting stations on election day or uh, to be sure people are registered to vote in the first place. So there's so many ways to live out our faith in public. Um, Reverend Smallwood was talking about the changing demographics of our country. You know, in response to that, we really have two options. And you see people taking both options, right? One is to suppress the voice of, of all the people uh, whose voice we don't want to hear. And the other is to listen to those voices in a spirit of humility and love and respond to them. I think it's an act of love and hospitality to be sure that all those voices are heard. And, uh, you know, Democracy 101, the primary way that happens is in the voting booth. So surely helping people get registered to vote is a good way of living out our faith in public and ensuring that all the voices at the table are heard. Absolutely, and, and and you know, and, and thinking about thinking about all the voices, um, and and also those demographic changes, which is certainly happening in the state of Arkansas. Um, you know, there's been a, a pretty steady surge, really, since uh, about 25 years ago, in the growth growth of the Hispanic Latinx population in the state of Arkansas, uh, where at one point we had the fastest growth um, um, in the country. Um, and a lot of that, of course, had to do with the kind of employment available here in the state of Arkansas and the recruitment toward that type of employment. So, you know, uh, folks who came here and who, um, you know, made the made the landscape um, better. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I have to ask, what is it about, uh, you know, the Black, the Latinx, and the LGBTQ plus voting bloc that makes them targets for consistent voter disenfranchisement? Um, you know, and then what does that say about the collective political power of these marginalized groups uh, in the state of Arkansas, where, um, you know, white folks who are Christians comprise more than 60 percent of, uh, of the state? Uh, you know, there was a movie that came out years ago called Fear of a Black Planet. It was kind of a satire uh, comedy type thing, but uh, I'm often reminded of that. You know this kind of uh, inexorable fear of, of um, and, and that's what it kind of looks like to me, fear of uh, of that. And so again, the question: What is what does it say about the collective political power of, of uh, the so-called marginalized groups in the state, uh, Reverend Dr. Smallwood? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. It most most definitely is fear. Uh, but it's fear of the unknown and it's fear of the loss of power. So in our country, uh, power has been uh, essentially corralled by a certain power mongering group. And the way that you keep that power is to knock everyone else down. There was a hope in the beginning after the Civil War that perhaps this idea of opening up the notion of freedom, the ideology of freedom uh, could involve others. But unfortunately, the Puritan ethos continues to raise its ugly head. And this idea of American uh, patriotism, this idea of white nationalism, and this idea of Christianity as, a, as the nation's uh, so-called chosen religion have coalesced to create for us in this country 
a real conundrum when it comes to how the Bible is even used and deployed as a weapon. So that's how you can see on January the 6th, people holding the Bible in images of that day, walking in lockstep with people who are holding nooses that they have created. And this notion that, that we are the chosen ones. Uh, my very dear friend, author of uh, The Myths That America Lives By, Richard Hughes, suggests that this idea of the chosen nation is a myth, but it's one that's so deeply embedded in the, in the uh, pathos of American life. And because that pathology has played itself out, uh, the con those who are in control have always had the, uh, the ability to knock others down. What we find is that the Marxian idea of the folk on the margins coming together, you know, if Latinx and Black folks and uh, sensitized white folks could come together and really create for themselves a new majority, uh, that would solve this problem. Unfortunately, though, we operate in our silos. We have to advocate for our own. And the capacity for us to literally create policy and think about the next 25 to 50 years together uh, seems to, to somehow escape our planning. And I want to suggest, uh, even in this forum, that there is a way forward and that way forward is to, first of all, understand precisely what Reverend Clegg said. Um, there's only one supreme being, and that is not a white person. And once we come to grips with the fact that justice, justice shall you pursue, until we come to understand that every human being is made in the image of God, that that imprimatur uh, is what is controlling. And until this country comes to grips with its own original and continuing sins, that really is in my mind, the reckoning. And we're at that place. You know, um, from Dr. Smallwood, I, it had its effect, I'm thinking right now, because I, I you know, now I have to now begin to wonder, um, you know, what is, um, because a lot of these folks are very convinced of what they're doing. Uh, they're very convicted by it. it, it um, they, they suggest that uh, what they're doing is informed by their faith and, you know, also because these conversations we're having uh, are for the consideration of those who, um, you know, would be a part of this Micah Fellows program. Um, and so in some ways instructive, you know, I, I have to wonder aloud, you know, what is the, and, 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 and I'm careful because I, I don't like when folks weaponize the Bible or when folks weaponize, weaponize the scriptures. But, you know, I, I, I often wonder myself, what is, where are they errant? I mean, I, I feel like I know, you know, where they are in terms of what our faith tradition, what our, um, um, what our religion, if you will, um, leads us to understand. Uh, where are these folks are and how they, and how they operate? Um, you know, because uh, when Rose referred to the, 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 the uh, preacher in the, in the meeting, those folks voted the way they, they were going to but I feel like some folks uh, left convinced that they were maybe not necessarily doing the right thing. And then what ended up happening was some amendments, though latent, were added to, uh, added to that. And so, you know, how do we get to that space where, you know, not necessarily again, um, you know, because I think it be can become a, a back and forth, but where, and I, I would address this to anyone who's prepared to answer, you know, how do we, how do we deal with that uh, when folks are so convinced of, and they, they feel like they have the, uh, the biblical ammo to back up what they're doing. 
Brian, um, I, so I've been working in the immigrants rights movement for about 10, 11 years now. Um, and we've seen a lot of the changes um, in narrative. Uh, we've seen a lot of the changes in, even in, in the grossest of legislators. Um, thank you, Mama. Um, in the grossest of legislators, we've seen a, a shift, but it was because the Dreamer Network did their due diligence of educating these legislators. We, we were insistent. We were having sit-ins in their offices. Um, you know, we, we were talking about why these laws were important for us or why they were harmful for us. And we were able to change the narrative. We, um, and y'all can see it in, in, in this current administration, they've, they've done away with the term illegal alien. Um, and it was because of 20 years of the immigrants' rights work that they've now abolished that term. Um, so our stories are powerful. And the way that we share them um, and the way that we connect with them, um, that was what helped us shift that narrative because citizenship, um, legal permanent resident, dreamer, DACA, those were toxic words at one point in time. And um, our stories were, a, were the reason that we were able to shift that narrative change. So I'll always go back to that is, is uh, our, nar our narrative. Absolutely. Uh, I remember back in two legislative sessions ago where I heard sitting in the gallery appeals from the floor by house, uh, people using uh, scriptures referring to how we should treat uh, the immigrant among us. And I was, uh, was very surprised. And so, you know, how do we get to that narrative change though, Reverend Clegg? I mean, um, you know, I, I think um, Christians in general, uh, white Christians in particular, uh, can be so attached to a particular way of knowing themselves and a particular way of, of doing things that it seems intractable. I really appreciate, Rosa, that you talk about the fact that this was a 20-year thing because it made me realize that, yes, I remember back in 2001 when, uh, well, back in 1999, when um, legislators, a majority Democratic legislature, talked about us having an immigrant problem, you know, uh, so I, I appreciate that perspective that it takes that long. Uh, but how long, Reverend Clegg? Uh, how, how long must we wait? Longer than we should, to be sure. And, um, you know, every Sunday at Second Baptist, I open up the scriptures, right? And I hope that my ministry speaks for itself in terms of how I feel about the scriptures and my devotion to the scriptures. With that said, however, um, <clears throat> A lot of our problem is our basic posture before we ever open up the Bible. And is our posture in solidarity with the least of these, right? Is our solidarity, is our posture uh, knowing the names and seeing the faces of hurting people? Um, you know, Ryan, you and I first connected, it seems like, um, with an event about Howard Thurman. And uh, he wrote Jesus and the disinherited. Do we find our Jesus amongst the disinherited? And if so, that will change the way we read the scripture. And the other side of that is if we find our Jesus amongst the powerful. Uh, we've talked about power already in this. I, I think power is something white Christians have not talked about enough. Mm. Uh, we've talked about faith and hope and love, all of which is good, but we have not talked about power. And the way power flows from our God, not, not all power is bad. We need power. I believe God to be one of power. But the way that power is stewarded needs to be talked about more, preached about more. And so before we ever open up the Bible, am I sitting with the least of these and finding my God there? Or am I sitting amongst the thrones of the powerful and finding my God there? That will impact the way I... I read every chapter and verse of the Bible, right? And so it's more of a fundamental hermeneutical posture than it is how we interpret certain verses along the way. And until we change that, I don't see much changing because we'll be flinging Bible verses at one another and missing the Jesus of the disinherited all along the way. So what I would advocate for is a transformative 
posture before we ever pick up the Bible so that we can hear from a God who was crucified uh, instead of making, making that God into the God we want that God to be, if that makes sense. I'm glad you brought Howard Thurman into this conversation. Uh, made me think of, and I, I believe this is from Jesus and this in here, he talked about um, the fact that the weight of the Christian movement has been on the side of the strong and the, and the powerful uh, as opposed to the weak and oppressed. And then he says, despite the gospel, you know, despite the gospel, we still uh, exercise, the, the institutional church in particular exercises its, um, its practices on the side of the powerful. And, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, even, even in, um, you know, um, the, 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 the denomination where I hang my hat, that, that, um, that tends to be the case that um, um, not that I want to, I mean, you know, as, as, as a Marxist materialist on top of that, it, uh, it, um, um, it bothers me because, I mean, this, this does negate the gospel. And it also negates some of our own preaching. You know, this um, um, grasp for, for power, um, you know, for, for individual power. And so how do we, I mean, I, I just, it seems intractable. Um, how do we get to a space where churches really start at least considering that, right? You know, Rosa talked about a 20-year narrative change. And so, you know, where do, where do we begin? Um, makes me think of another, uh, another book, Where Do We Go From Here? Uh, Dr. King's last um, uh, and very instructive, I think, um, book. And so, you know, I would ask that question. Um, that sounds like an ending question. We're not ending, though. But, but where do we go from here? And specifically, where do we go from here in, in, in talking to, um, to, to church folks, uh, especially those who are in positions of leadership in churches to get them to, um, to understand that how we operate is uh, not on the side of the weak and oppressed. And I know every church will say, mine included, will say, well, we have a, we have a, a, a food pantry. And we, we open our church to, to these things. And, and we do these other things, um, which I, I, I don't think we should negate. I think those, those are great and wonderful things. But, you know, where do we, um, how do we move the needle a little bit and get churches to really start thinking seriously about, you know, how we participate in, for one, and also, um, how we can push past uh, what seems to always be a grasp for individual power. I'd like to weigh in on that uh, and help us understand two things. Uh, the Bible itself was a, was a groping for power, the canonization process, what went into it, how we revere it. Uh, you asked the question about errancy or inerrancy uh, earlier in this conversation. The reality is that we know hermeneutically uh, that the Bible has been cast uh, as a power dynamic. Uh, and so there has to be some hermeneutics of suspicion, even as we look at biblical passages, uh, because otherwise the Bible can be used to to do the suppressing voter and otherwise in every aspect of our lives. Uh, the rationalities that we operate in have all been subject to the misuse of the Bible. I'll give you an example. Here in Tennessee, where I live, the governor, Bill Lee, goes to a church pastor by a man named Reverend Steve Berger. Now, Reverend Berger was in DC at the time of the insurrection. He claimed to be there just to be praying for America. But he took it upon himself to do a YouTube video, a Facebook post, to help shape the narrative of who was there and who was really causing the problem. Why did he uh, avail himself? Why did he offer himself uh, as a license to that level of power? Because he pastors the governor, who in this state is all for uh, gun-toting white folks who can shoot down Negroes as often and as uh, willingly as they desire. 
who will do voter suppression in some of the most arcane ways, who have done things like put uh, laws on the book that they know will not pass constitutional muster, but doing so because they are in power. Now, this notion of speaking truth to power that uh, Rosa Velasquez brought up earlier in her example of what went on in the legislative press process is a very interesting term. It's a very interesting phraseology. But what I wanna caution us to do, particularly as people of faith, is not just be postured to speak truth to power, but to speak truth in power. And where does that power come from? I think Reverend Clegg helped us to see that we need to tap into the power source that is our God. What happened to the level of faith that moves mountains? What happened to the level of faith that could pray and ask God to change the hearts of the kings and the queens? What happened to the level of faith that says, I can ask anything in your name and you will give it to me? I am suggesting then that people of faith have been living under or beneath their means. And there is a power source that we can tap into. Uh, we say it this way in scripture, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Right now in our Congress, there is a, a demonic principality operating in Congress. How do we dismantle that principality? What are our tools? Now, Audrey Lord would tell us the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So there must be something in the spiritual cosmology of those who have faith that can move that. And I'm not talking about calling uh, God to kill folks, even though opening up the ground and letting some of them fall in does come to mind. The idea here is to get back in touch with the truth of the Bible, understanding that the document itself, we need help understanding its real truth. This is why we have the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth. Because if you haven't noticed, truth has been placed on, on trial in America. And truth needs witnesses to unveil its guiltless plan. I feel like I should offer a benediction at this point, Reverend. I can smile with I come on now. Now I can move a little bit. Uh, but you know, one of the things that you um you just talked about is uh, you know, a hermeneutic of suspicion. Um you know, the fact that, you know, we ought to, in my mind, meaning we, we need to examine the text. Uh, and in examining the text, we need to examine ourselves and examine our actions, examine how we, uh, how we uh, confront, for lack of a better word, society uh, within the context of, uh, of uh, our spiritual text. And uh, also made me think about the fact that um, in states like Arkansas, where the levels of poverty are high, um, you know, that one, there is a coalition to be built uh, among folks who have a particular collective interest in not having our votes suppressed uh, and not uh, being, a, being a, 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 not having the right to petition uh, and to put things on the ballot uh, taken from us or, 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 or making it more difficult for those things to happen. You know, but a lot of these politicians, they set up boogeymen. Uh, they say, well, you know, some George Soros is going to come into your state and, and he's going to put weird things on the ballot. You don't want that to happen. Uh, or they say, you know, there are droves of Mexicans who are walking here and they're just walking into the libraries and voting. You know, we don't want that to happen. Um, and so, you know, you combine that with what I think of as a, a sort of political nihilism that um, and let me not say that, because that's some of it. But some of the nihilism, I think, comes from the fact that, that um, you know, uh, poor folks, working poor folks, 
you know, don't have the, the luxury uh, in a lot of ways of time to, uh, to, to rake through the muck that uh, uh, a lot of folks in political power kind of throw, throw up in, in our way. And so, you know, how do we, how do we counteract that? How do we, um, I don't want to say convince folks, because uh, I don't think people are stupid. I don't think folks require my strong leadership or conviction. But how do we um, get together and build these communities? You know, I think about, you know, I, I, this series is called The Greatest of These. And, um, you know, I still believe in the idea that the greatest of these is love. You know, how does that figure into the equation in terms of building this coalition? You know, um, love too often comes across as this namby-pamby thing where we hug each other and we, we eat together and we do these social things, but we don't struggle together in love, unfortunately. You know, so I would continue to ask that question, where do we go from here? How do we get there? You know, if I, I think that's one of the, the most explicitly stated things in the biblical text, uh, that the greatest of these is love. You know, so how do we get there, Rosa? I think um, Reverend Dr. Cornell West said it better. Justice is what love, look, love looks like. Um, I think that it's time that we embrace each other. We're y'all. We're so much stronger together. There's more that unites us than that that divides us. Um, we have to lift each other up. Um, start protecting each other is what love looks like. Show up for each other. I know that there's a collective happening in Arkansas called the Black and Brown Power Coalition. Um, and that to me has brought light to what solidarity looks like. We're talking about last year, whenever the, the, um, the uprisings were happening, um, I was out there, <laughs> the Latinx community showed up. Whenever our kids um, were being detained at the border, the kids in cages were being detained at the border, um, who showed up for us? Black women showed up for us. And that to me was so powerful, but that to me was, was love. Showing up for each other and, and providing, um, providing that, that embrace with our communities, that's, that's to me love. Everything. Yeah, I have very little to add to that. That was so beautifully stated, uh, except maybe to say uh, I'm, I'm also at a place where I think telling the truth is an expression of love. And, it, you know, it's not just that we tell the truth because we don't want to break one of God's laws. We tell the truth because we cannot have community uh, apart from truth. We can't have real community of depth apart from truth. And we're in this day where it's real easy for people to pivot and um, I'll call it the pivot of the privilege maybe, uh, I like that, uh, where you, you change the focus off of the problem and put the focus on something that isn't really a problem at all, right? Like you saw it last summer with the, the protest, you know, what about the, uh, what about the violence of the protests, which really didn't exist uh, in any speakable way. It just was a way of diverting attention. Uh, you see it with uh, vo the voting suppression, right? Last year, if I'm uh, correct about this, Ryan, you probably know better than I do, Arkansas was 50th in the country last election in voter turnout. So why are we passing legislation concerned about uh, you know, voting integrity when the problem is voting turnout, it's a way of pivoting and moving the spotlight somewhere else. You see it with critical race theory, right? All these white denominations today that are having a fit over critical race theory, they're much more concerned about critical race theory than they are racism. And all of these ways are a way to eschew the truth, right? It's, it's a path of comfort. It's a path that asks other people to change, not me. It's a path that asks for token benevolence and not, you know, systemic justice. And so one of the ways that I think about loving my neighbor in a substantive, deep gospel kind of way is telling the truth, telling the truth about myself, telling the truth about what I see happening in the world today. It doesn't mean that the truth belongs to me but it does mean I belong to the truth and I have to go wherever that truth takes me. So 
to the to the point about justice, I would add a concern for the truth today as an expression of loving our neighbors. Hmm. I'm glad this is being recorded. And this is, uh, you know, this is almost like sermon prep for me and several things. Uh, as it, say that again, as a, that last part, as an expression of my name. Okay, good. This is being recorded, so I can find that. Something else that was said, Reverend Dr. Smallwood, you talked about the fact that we've been living beneath our means. Preston commented on that, and uh, I'm glad because that, uh, that struck me in the same way. And, you know, I think uh, far, too, far too often, uh, among Christians, we uh, we have a woe is me uh, 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 kind of attitude, a spiritual poverty where we just we'll just pray this thing away. And you said we've been living beneath our means. What are the means that we can bring to bear to to counteract um, in specific, um, you know, these moves toward voter suppression? and the complete and total lack of interest of our government and the folks who run it in engaging folks and, and, and civic engagement in general. And I would ask that to, to the wider group, but uh, you know, Dr. Smallwood, just uh, an expansion of what you said, we've been living beneath our means. You know, so what are the means that we should uh, at least consider bringing to bear uh, as church communities? So you have invoked uh, Howard Thurman and Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Howard Thurman wrote another piece talking about the common good. And King's piece on where do we go from here asked the question by Colin, chaos or community? Now, a lot of people have uh, viewed chaos as a terrible starting point and community being the, the desired end. But I want to invoke this notion that perhaps King was saying, uh, our own creator worked with chaos to bring the world into existence and advance a different notion that I heard from a young ethical or theoethical scholar who basically says there's no way to escape chaos. So we have to get creative. And creativity is the marksmanship of our God. So if Rosa Velasquez can tell me that a 20 year process brought about a change in nomenclature and I can tell you that from the moment that craniology was used to try and cause black people to look as though they were beast-like and through a series of mantras, I am a man, I'm black and I'm proud, uh, black power, black lives matter. Over, a, over several decades, if that can bring us to a place where even when a black man's breath is pressed out of his body by a knee on his neck. If the power of that death could bring about a whole world's taking note, you know they were chanting in Germany and London, England and other places, black lives matter. Then really, we need to take chaos to a new level and not be concerned when a judge wants to shut down someone like uh, Maxine Waters for saying we have to get more confrontational and understand the complexity of what confrontation means. So what are our means? Truth is our means. And we've got to tell it to our children. We got to tell it to our educators who have been captivated by a system that doesn't even appreciate them and make them come to some understanding of what to teach our children. Where did we go 
when we couldn't feel the hurt and the pain of folks whose children were separated from them at the borders of America? Is it because we failed to recognize the ways in which our own children as black people were separated from us in the, in the institution of chattel slavery? My point being, get in touch with your origin histories. Confront them because in it is a, is a level of liberation that causes us to change everything so that I can reimagine living in a community where people don't get shot down by police. I can imagine living in a community where we don't have to cage people, period. I can imagine, and I can actually put forth the effort to bring forth the groundswell that says, we don't need taxation without representation. And I can sell that to my folk. I can stay in their face long enough to help them understand and grip the truth of that. So when Angela Davis asked the question, are prisons absolute loot or uh, obsolete? I can answer yes, we don't need them. And stand flat footed. So our means, creativity. Creative. Umba. Great value. Kawaii would suggest. Creativity. Rosa, Reverend Rosa Velasquez. What are our means? How do we, how do we get where we're going? I, I cannot follow uh, Reverend Smallwood, <laughs> but what, what I can add um, is uh, is reimagining, as, as she was saying, somebody imagined a three-month-old separated from their mother at the border. Somebody imagined a 13-year-old boy in handcuffs okay. in the back of a police car. Why can't we reimagine what public safety looks like? Why is that such a radical idea when that was the system that is existent now is working as it should be to protect the white folks that are in power, right? So why is it such a radical idea, a radical thought, or why are we even called extremists for saying abolish the police, you know, defund ICE? Let's reimagine this whole, whole system. Reverend Clay. Reverend Dr. Preston Plague. Um, one of my favorite writers says that there's only two ways that humans really change. Our defense mechanisms are so strong that there's only two things that cause real human change. One is profound suffering and the other is profound love. That until some, until I'm willing to take someone else's position as my position and their suffering as my suffering until I'm willing to stand in proximity to them so that their life in a way becomes my life, uh, nothing will change. Or we will suffer to the point that, um, that death demands we change, right? Uh, and I think Honestly, this may be a, an oversimplification, but I'm not sure how much it is. I think those are the two options before us. We are either going to suffer our way until we decide we're close enough to death to go a different way, or we will discover this radical love, which as you said, Ryan, is more than sentimentality and warm fuzzies. It has to do with our wills, right? Until we find the sort of love that wills the good for ourselves, our neighbors, the world, then not much will change. And so my prayer is that we love our way to transformation uh, until we, uh, or, or before we suffer our way to transformation, if that makes sense. Uh, so as simple and hollow as this can sound, I believe love is our means. Uh, 
I believe love is the most powerful thing in all the world. I believe it changes people. I think it changes structures. I think it changes minds. Uh, but it's not something we just know. It's something we have to do. Love is an action verb. Yes, indeed. Well, siblings, as we uh, near the end of our time together, I want to say again, uh, thank you very much. I, I think that we could um, we could probably extend this a whole another hour, but uh, this conversation is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And and I, I feel uh, um, I feel fortunate, uh, really. Um, I hope that's not a selfish notion, but I really do feel fortunate. Uh, to have been able to uh, participate in this and to, um, uh, I hesitate to call it moderate. All I did was, you know, say some words and you all, um, you know, responded in kind and I appreciate that. Y'all mind if I take a text today, you know, in Second Kings where you see the prophet Elisha and his uh, students, they decide in the middle of war and famine that they're all going to go down to the Jordan River, a river with a whole lot of meaning to them. And each one's going to chop down the tree. You all know the text. And, um, you know, uh, there's several things to love about that story. I can love the fact that, you know, uh, a miracle of God uh, defied physics and a floating axe head, a piece of metal floated up out the river. I think that's the one most folks will shout about, right? But for me, the, the, the most wonderful thing about uh, that text or the, you know, the, the revelation for me in that text is in the fact that, um, in, in, in a time of famine, in a time of war, that this school of prophets um, saw fit for each one of them to go down to the river and chop down a tree, uh, such that that uh, person who lost uh, uh, their ax head was, was in distress about it because they wouldn't be able to fulfill their responsibility. And so I really uh, thought about that when you all talked about the means that we have. We do have, um, you know, even in our poverty, uh, even in our poverty of imagination, we still have imagination, and that imagination can be expanded. Uh, even in the paucity of love, we still have some love out there. Uh, love lifted me. And so uh, thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you very kindly. Um, and um, um, look forward to uh, more conversation. Look forward to your counsel as we uh, pursue this uh, Michael Fellows program, and and what does the Lord require of us except that we uh, do justice, love, mercy, and that we walk with humility with our God. Thank you to Reverend Dr. Teresa Smallwood. Thank you to Reverend Rosa Velasquez. Thank you to Reverend Dr. Preston Clegg, and thank you to my patient host and friend, Reverend Chantel Hinton Hill. Thank you all, it was a joy.